G'day guys and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel today, taking a look at uh, some of the teams so far in 2022 who uh, have surprised us one way or the other, whether they've exceeded expectations or have fallen flat on some high expectations going into 2022. So after three rounds, I feel like we've kind of learned enough to be making these sorts of calls. I'm recording this one game into round four. So Port Adelaide has just been annihilated by Melbourne at Adelaide Oval last night, which kind of prompted the idea of making this video to look at some of the teams that have, uh, have really fallen flat or have exceeded expectations this year. So we're making this video a little bit early and uh, obviously, you know, the events that could transpire by the time this video comes out uh, could, you know, make me look silly. But we're just looking at this video in the context of in the first three rounds, what we've seen so far, who's disappointed and who has done way better than we expected. So obviously looking at uh, the latter after three rounds, it's, it's never going to give you the full picture of how a season's going to go ahead. But looking at it so far, I think it's a fairly reasonable reflection of which teams are, are doing really well and which teams have been quite poor so far. So we're going to start off, uh, I'm going to go through four teams, and the first of which is the most topical perhaps after last night's drubbing, and that is Port Adelaide. So, so far this season, Port Adelaide have lost to Brisbane at the Gabba in round one. They then got torched by Hawthorne by 64 points at home. Then they lost the showdown after the siren and then of course last night held to an embarrassing 32 point loss I think it was in the end to Melbourne uh, that really could have been more on paper you know 32 points doesn't uh, look too bad but obviously you have to look at the fact that they just avoided their lowest score last night by kicking a few goals at the end of the game and only kicked their first goal of the game deep into the third quarter it's the first time in their history they'd ever gone goalless at half time. And when you're looking at a team who has gone back to back prelims, uh, they've kind of carried their form from the 2021 prelim against the Western Bulldogs, where they got absolutely annihilated. They've carried that form into this year. And we're sort of at the point where you have to look at that prelim and the form they're showing this year and wonder if they're connected. You know, at the time, uh, I personally was sort of happy to write it off as, uh, as a really, really poor performance in a big final, but nonetheless, are still more or less a once off from a team that was relatively consistent over those couple of years at the top as well. But when they are playing absolutely no better four rounds into 2022, then you have to start to look at it in a bigger sort of picture. They do have their injury woes, and some of them are really key players. We know Charlie Dixon's out of that forward line, so they're having to rely on uh, guys like Georgiatis, Marshall, and Finn Lason, none of whom are quite the player that Charlie Dixon is right now. And regardless of talent, also in terms of size, Charlie Dixon is a much bigger focal point than any of the other key forwards that they've got in that forward line. They're also missing Aaliyah down back, who was certainly one of the best key defenders last year and uh, structurally losing you know, your best forward and your best defender in one hit, it's going to have some sort of impact. I know that Fantagia's missing down forward as well and uh, Clory has missed some games as well. So structurally, Port Adelaide do have some woes. But for me, it doesn't quite explain the form that we've seen this year. They've looked really, really down on confidence, They're not moving the ball well at all. And you have to also consider some of the coaching losses they sustained as well. Michael Voss has joined Carlton, seems to be doing well. And Jared Schofield was a big part of that successful little era Port Adelaide have had in recent years. He's left from a midfield coaching position to join the West Coast Eagles. Port Adelaide was so bad that Kane Corns has come out and said it was the most disappointing half in their history. And obviously Kane Corns, while he may not be the most respected AFL opinion, you have to look at it through the context of a, a former club champion and uh, undoubtedly a big fan of the Port Adelaide Footy Club. He says, there's a sense of inevitability uh, referring to Hinckley maybe moving on. He said, this is the last thing I'll say about this, but he's earned the right. He's been an exceptional coach for that football club to be given more than four weeks. So while he's been very critical on uh, the way Port Adelaide have gone about it, I think there's some validity to what he's saying. There seems to be a huge anti-Hinkley campaign at the moment from Port fans louder than anyone. But he suggests that uh, with the position that they're currently at, Hinkley needs a little bit more time. And Hinkley's earned the right to sort of try and steady the ship a little bit, at least for the rest of the year. There's been some criticism of uh, Port Adelaide's game plan. In particular, last night, they were choosing to bomb the ball in long to their forwards. And when you've got some of the best intercept defenders in the game playing for the opposition team in Melbourne. Uh, obviously, you can criticize that game plan, but whether or not that's a deliberate strategy from Port Adelaide there to, to try and bomb the long ball in, I doubt it personally. I think there's probably issues further up the ground, and I'm at a bit of a loss to explain exactly what that is, because bizarrely, they are the number one clearance team in the competition right now, Port Adelaide, but it's from generating that clean ball inside 50 where they're really breaking down. So with Carlton next week at the MCG, this season could be over very soon for the Port Adelaide Footy Club. While we're on the topic of Carlton, we'll nominate them as the next big 
big surprising team so far from 2022, but this time in a more positive sense because it appears maybe their rebuild may finally be over. Since 2015, they've had five bottom four finishes. They've won two wooden spoons in that time and finished 13th last year. So it's sort of become a question of when will Carlton improve? Currently, however, they sit 3-0 with wins over Richmond, the Dogs, and Hawthorne, and they've got the Gold Coast Suns later this round as well, where you'd think they go 4-0. You don't have to look too hard to sort of try and identify the reasons why Carlton have come good. We talked about their midfield depth on this channel, uh, although they've only played one game where Cripps, Chera, and Walsh are all playing, if I'm not mistaken. But I think it's been the re-emergence of Paddy Cripps as an absolute elite ball winner so far, probably winning the Brownlow medal. Obviously, he's been out of form over the last couple of years, but to have both he and Sam Walsh playing the football that they're capable of at the same time is a huge game changer for him. They've added guys like Hewitt, who's uh, had a pretty good start to his career there, and Chera is also a pretty good midfielder as part of that front three trio. And it kind of takes the pressure of guys like Zach Williams, who they've recruited, you know, two years ago. Maybe he can actually settle down as a defender without having to be that prime on baller like they tried to make him be. Unsurprisingly, clearances are really where Carlton are getting a hold of teams, and that was really evident against Hawthorne, scoring a lot from that sort of center stoppage situation, which, you know, when you look at their midfield on ballers, that is no surprise. But it's not just in the midfield where they're gaining their ascendancy. Uh, forward of centre is arguably just a bigger factor. Finally, they have the twin towers of Harry Mackay and Kerno playing together. And Kerno has sort of been this elusive talent that's been injured for, you know, perennially. Mackay's breaking out last year and won the Coleman medal. So having both of those as a forward threat really, really adds a different dynamic to the way they go forward. And then you've got Jacob Wiedering, who's uh, one of the best young key backs in the comp, really rounding out their spine. So when you look at having elite players or at least elite talents in key positions, Carlton looked very, very sweet for a number of years. If there's been one concern from my observations on them, it's probably been the, the goal swings, the momentum swings. They almost uh, coughed up a six-goal lead against Hawthorne. In fact, I think they lost the lead before eventually holding on. And uh, they also had a big lead over the Western Bulldogs, which nearly got erased as well, only winning the game by 12 points. And even if you look at the Richmond game, they had to come from behind to do that. Uh, it ended with them having a good momentum swing. But So for them, the next step is to run out complete four-quarter performances. But from what we've seen so far, Far, their best footy is certainly top eight quality. Next, we'll talk about Hawthorne, who finished 14th and 15th over the last two years. And uh, not many people really rated their potential upside this year. I think there was a belief they needed to get some good kids in. Admittedly, they've drafted pretty well over the last couple of years from my observations. So for me, it's been a little bit of a surprise to see them click into uh, what has been a very good brand of footy pretty early. So round one was a fairly standard win over North, you know, won by a few goals, not too groundbreaking considering where North Melbourne are at. But they really caught the attention of the AFL world and certainly myself with a 64 point win over Port Adelaide at Adelaide Oval. Now, you have to also consider the context of Port Adelaide and not playing great footy at the moment either, but still to clinically win by 64 points, that was a performance of what looks like a very, very good footy team. The notable observations from that Port Adelaide game were that Port Adelaide controlled possession and they won the clearances 54 to 30, but Hawthorne were just far more lethal and the way they rebound with the footy is, uh, is the way they win games as well. So despite losing the clearances by 24 and having 12 less inside 50s and also factoring in they were pretty accurate with their set shots on goal, they won by 64 points. So it certainly looks to be, you know, a bit of a change of philosophy for Hawthorne, obviously a new coach uh, with Sam Mitchell at the helm now. I noticed they've earmarked Tom Mitchell for a, a bit of a different role, perhaps more of a defensive running role. He in particular is spending a lot less time at centre bounces and his average disposal has also plummeted from, you know, 34.3 last year to just 26, which is still a very, very good average, but it just speaks to a bit of a different change in role. This is a quote from Sam Mitchell. He says, we need to find ways to not be 18th for centre bounces, but we don't want to lose our defensive running, which has held us in really good Instead, I think we're second at stopping turnover scores. So clearly his focus is not so much on the center stoppage, it's what happens after that. They're ranked as second in rebound 50s, which comes as no surprise because all preseason we've been talking about, you know, the run and carry that's really evident on that Hawthorne back line. So they're the best team as well in the league for defensive scoring. So scoring from rebounds out of the back half. And what has been very handy for them as well is having a key forward who's been able to put the good quality football up the field onto the scoreboard as well with young Mitch Lewis bobbing up for nine goals, I think, in three games, which actually has him third in the Coleman medal. But naturally, of course, they've still got guys like Gunster and Bruce in that forward line, so they've got a variety of attacking options, and so far, so good for the Hawthorne Footy Club. Then we'll talk about Collingwood, who uh, in particular have really impressed me this season. After finals in 2020, they obviously had that massive clean out where they shed, shed some salary. Uh, Trelaw was the biggest name to 
depart that club. Aggressively drafted for a couple of years, and many, including myself, thought this rebuild might be a little bit more prolonged than it appears to be now. They currently sit 2-1, and one, and uh, in my opinion, have played some very, very impressive football. They beat the St Kilda in round one and played a really good, attractive, pressure style. They beat Adelaide quite easily, as you'd expect. And then the fact that they nearly toppled Geelong as well shows to me that they've come a long way as a footy team. Against the Cats, they looked the better of the two teams for three quarters. They kicked nine goals in the third term to open up a 37-point lead. Their pressure's been a really big highlight for me. And I do have a theory, perhaps, that pressure that game style was sort of not conducive to them running out four quarters as we saw a much more experienced Geelong side get the W in the end. They rank second in front half intercepts and are first for points from front half intercepts as well. So their ability to sort of lock the ball in their front half has uh, been a huge factor in them playing some good football. And again, their pressure really stacks up well when you consider their fourth in the league for tackles. You know, we know about Collingwood's top end elite talent, uh, guys like Darcy Moore, Taylor Adams, Dugowie, Howe, Grundy, and I'm probably missing quite a few others in there as well. But with those guys being, you know, fit and healthy and actually playing, you know, in the same team together has coincided with a few good young guns coming on. Uh, we all know about Nick Dacos, Oliver Henry has really impressed me as well. Bo McCreary looks like he has a fair bit of talent. And then the recruitment of Pat Lipinski into their midfield as well has been a welcome addition. So to me, it kind of looks like they play a really good team brand of footy. To me, it looks like it's conducive to playing finals. I guess their biggest threat will be injury and being able to sustain that energy for large periods of the season. So those are the four teams that I've got listed as being probably the most surprising out of the, the teams that we've seen this year so far. Three in a positive sense and Port Adelaide the biggest outlier there in the most disappointing way possible. I've had a cue... There's probably a few more you could add to this list. I have uh, had exceptions for Essendon, who so far have played three of last year's top four as well. They haven't been great, but for me, aren't quite on that Port Adelaide level of deplorable yet. You could also throw West Coast into the mix there, finishing ninth last year, and I'm sure some would say they expected the Eagles to finish low this year. But you could argue, you know, finishing last after four rounds, uh, which is quite likely in my opinion, is surprising. But I think we can give them a mulligan based on, uh, you know, the whole COVID situation ripping through the footy club at the moment. But that's it, guys. That is my four teams let me know in the comments what you agree with and what you disagree with how far do you think those three teams that I nominated in particular Collingwood Carlton and Hawthorne how far do you think that will go this year will they play finals and again can Port Adelaide resurrect their season and do you think Ken Hinckley should get the sack as always guys I appreciate you watching the videos hope you're enjoying the content if you are please consider subscribing to the channel uh, because uh, that would be great I do intend to do a Geelong and Brisbane Lions a live stream tonight as well so you can keep an eye out for that. Hopefully I'll have this video up by then. And hopefully I'll be home from work in time tomorrow to live stream the Eagles getting mauled by Collingwood. So stay tuned and I'll see you somewhere on YouTube. Cheers.